Hi everyone, welcome to my presentation about the limits of epistemic uncertainty quantification in low shot settings. And I am Matthias from the German Research Center for Artificial Intelligence in Bremen, Germany. So let me start with a small introduction about uncertainty in machine learning. Let's imagine that we have a trained model that we train on a training set of dogs versus cat, which is a standard benchmark now. Um, and this model outputs some softmax probabilities. Now, what happens if you um, give it an image of a human? What should be the output probabilities in, in this case? Because, of course, then a model trained in dogs versus cat cannot recognize uh, humans. And also, what happens if you give it a dog and a cat at the same time? while well, the model is actually trained on dogs and cats separately. So I want you to think about what are the probabilities that make sense in this case. And in general, in this case, uh, the model should output its maximum, let's say, uncertainty meaning that both probabilities for cat and dog classes should e be equal, and this indicates that you cannot decide if it's a cat or a dog. And this tells the user that maybe they should, uh, there's something wrong in the model or in the input data. So this is called uh, auto distribution detection. And the motivation for this work is that uh, uncertainty in machine learning is very, very important for safety, robustness, and trustworthiness. And in general, um, we want to estimate uh, mo uh, the uncertainty of a, of a model given an input as a way to um, to, um, to gauge, let's say, if we can trust this prediction or not. So this is very useful for medical applications, for example, autonomous driving and all, all uh, applications that where humans are involved. And there are many uncertainty motivation methods that have been developed recently. I will mention some of them later. But most of them they do by they, they work or they are researched by improving a standard measurement like CIFAR um, 10 versus SVHN, auto diffusion detection, other benchmarks that there. But in general, people, what people do not look is that um, how does this change, like metrics, calibration, probability, uh, how does this change on the training set size? They, they, some metrics like calibration and uncertainty quality should not depend on the training set size, but on epistemic uncertainty, uh, which is usually modeled through probability, should reflect the training set size, meaning that there should be more uncertainty if your model is uh, trained on a very small uh, data set. So in this work, we evaluate epistemic uncertainty uh, as we vary the same training set in a, in a synthetic experiment on classification and regression tasks over multiple metrics, in, including um, auto distribution detection and quality of probabilities and entropy. So we have two basic research questions. One is that how does do uncertainty quantification methods behave a lot short settings? Should they, they should scale the performance gracefully um, and indicate that they are maybe also more less confident when the training set is small. And also, how does epistemic uncertainty scale with the size of the training set? So also, it, epistemic uncertainty is produced by a lack of data or information in the model. So this uncertainty should actually increase when you reduce the size of the training set. And we will test this in, in experiments now. So here I have a small description of the uncertainty quantification methods I'm using, or that we evaluate in this paper. So I'm going to give a brief description of each of them. And uh, you can check my paper about more details. So MC Dropout and MC Drop Connect some are methods that are used for regularization that basically we enable the dropping of activations for dropout or weights for drop connect at inference time. So you know, the model becomes stochastic and then you make multiple forward passes, something like 30 to 50 forward passes, and then you combine the predictions. And this usually um, estimates uncertainty much better than a single model. We also use ensembles. So you train n copies of the same model on the same data and all the the models they don't converge to the same ways, they converge to different predictions, and then you combine the predictions. And usually this is um, a very good method to estimate uncertainty, and it's very easy to, to explain and to, and to implement. Now to more state-of-the-art methods like direct uncertainty quantification, it's called DUQ. It's based on an RVF, like a radial basis function, that models um, the classes, the centers of each class, and then the distance for the center using the radial basis function kernel decides how much uncertain is the model. and then, the input is classified according to the distance, like the closest to the center is, is the class that will be predicted. And the, the centers are learnable using uh, gradient descent or other, other techniques. We also use variational inference with flip out. Basically, it's a Bayesian neural network that uses weight distributions. So, uh, so the, the weights of the, um, of the neural network are Gaussian distributions, and then you, we use gradient descent to learn these distributions. And flip out is basically used to. Um, to 
uh, stabilized training by reducing the variance of the stochastic model. We also have gradient based uncertainty where uh, the, the, the idea is to, com to compute the loss of the model and to compute the gradient of the loss and then use a um, uh, aggregation function that where you can get a scalar value, which is kind of an uncertainty or confidence value from the gradient of the loss. And to, to allow this, they use the, um, the autos propose to use the, a one hot encoded version of the label that is predicted by the model as a way to, because you in, uh, at the inference time you don't have a label. And face, finally, we have a baseline with a classical CNN or classical neural network without an uncertainty quantification. So here I have a, a small example is the two moons classification. So in the columns, you see different methods, that the methods I mentioned, and in rows, you see different number of samples for the training set. And here you're visualizing directly how uh, what is the performance on the training set. So this is a very simple example with a two moons uh, example from scikit-learn, where you can visually see the differences within different models. That you can see that when you increase the number of samples to 100, all the models they kind of pre predict good uncertainty in between the two moons. But once you reduce the, um, the size of the training set to let's say 10 samples, then some models are very, very confident, like gradients and flip out, but other models are not confident. They produce uncertainty all over the, um, the input space. And this indicates that they're actually working uh, properly. But now, if we move to a small regression sinusoid, it's, so you can see down here in the training samples, the actual training samples that we use here, here for regression. And we test a classic as in an drop and other methods. And you can see that the methods that they produce very similar uncertainty, like uh, the, um, the green points are basically the mean of the of the predictive distribution. And in blue, you can see one standard deviation of the, of the uncertainty. Uh, for example, the classical CNN actually doesn't fit the data very well until you get to 200 samples, but drop out, drop connect, they work uh, quite well. And now you look at the second slide, uh, and samples also doesn't fit really well the data, and flip out does fit the data quite well, but the problem is flip out is not modeling every uh, aleatoric uncertainty, like the uncertainty that is variable according to the data. And if we use flip out plus a negative log likelihood loss, you can actually fit, uh, fit the model much better. So you can see that here that the um, the models that were working quite well for uh, classification in the toy sample for the two moons don't really work that well for regression. So this shows that there are differences between the two, two setups or the two uh, tasks. So now as a main experimental setup, what we do is that we take the Cypher 10 and fashion image data, data sets and we make subsample versions of them. So we subsample the training set to a fixed number of samples that you can see here. Um, and basically, we for each uh, size of the training set, we randomly draw a fixed number of samples for each class without replacement. And for each value of S, we perform five trials when you train a model in the sample data set, and then you compute metrics on the on the test set of the corresponding. So the test set is fit size, so you can actually make comparisons. And when we, we report the mean and standard deviation of each metric or each value of the of the trials. So we have, and for metrics, we evaluate. Uh, mostly uh, entropy and maximum probability. So this gives you what is the confidence of the model, uh, because the maximum probability is usually the, the one that is used for the predicted class, and the entropy consists all the all the predicted probabilities. Uh, we also use look at accuracy, and accuracy of course will degrade with less samples. Uh, we also look at the expected calibration error, which is basically a measure between how much we can trust the confidence of a classifier, um, and it's basically a, a difference between the confidence and the accuracy of a of a model. While you basically take the, the predictions by confidence in, into, into bins to make a, like a kind of a histogram and then compute for each bin this difference within the, the predicted confidence and the actual accuracy, which is the, um, how many predictions at that bin were correct. And we also pre uh, perform auto distribution detection with this combination of, of data sets, basically fashion MNIST versus MNIST and Cypher 10 versus SVHN. And the idea is that these data sets don't share any of the, of their, um, of the classes, of the semantic classes. And for this, we use the, the area under the ROC curve as a metric, because it's basically invariant classification. So here you have a, a, the classification results for fashion image. So you can see that the test accuracy, of course, increases with the number of samples per class. Um, and the entropy also decreases in the, in the test set. So initially, the models are all uh, less confident, which is good. But of course, uh, one model, for example, DUQ has this kind of strange bump that is initially less confident and goes down, then goes up, and then goes, goes down again. And you can see, if you look at the maximum probability in the figure below, that DUQ has actually much less um, uh, confidence. Like, the maximum probability is very low at the beginning, 
with one sample per class, which is correct, and then increases until it reaches all the other methods. But all the other methods, uh, while they have quite high entropy, they also have a high maximum probability, which is actually not that good because the maximum probability should reflect the uncertainty in the, in the, of the model. And you can see here for uh, for fashion image the expected calibration error. So this tells you how the classifier is calibrated. And for the training set, most classifiers are calibrated except for the um, for the gradient based classifier. Uh, and the test uh, expected calibration error decreases also, which I think this is also something that should not happen because the idea of, of calibration is that um, the quality of probabilities, they don't depend on the size of the training set. And finally, you can also take a look at the test and all the um, performance using entropy and maximum probability. And you can see that the, the point of these two plots is that performance actually varies with the size of the training set. And I think it should not vary that much because the training set uh, is given only so much information about uh, how, the train, how, the, how the model uh, behaves. And we can see here now the results for Cypher 10. So they are very similar. Like there is a linear relationship between accuracy and samples per class. Entropy also decreases. <clears throat> and um, also the maximum probability, uh, it has basically the same behavior that DUQ is less confident than the rest. And I think this is correct. And the other models, maybe they're being uh, overconfident, which is also reflected by the, by the expected calibration error and by the auto distribution uh, um, under the core. So here you can see that there's a much more strong relationship between the between the, the number of samples per class and auto distribution performance. Like the, the AUK increases up to eighty up to eighty percent with entropy and up to almost eighty with um with maximum probability. And I think this also indicates that the models that really are not maybe not performing exactly how we will like, how we like. Like we like to the models to have more um independent uh, performance from the size of the range set for some metrics but not for others. Like for example, maximum probability should definitely have a variation with the uh, some number of samples of the class, but the spectacular calibration error and the auto decision performance, I think they don't should should not have the, um, this, this behavior. And now we, we are close to, to the end by this uh, having some analysis and discussion. So I mentioned a lot of these things already in the in the plots that we that we see. So all methods except uh, the ones that are based on gradients on gradient uncertainty across all training set size are well calibrated on the training set, but they are miscalibrated on the test set with improving calibration with training set size. And I think this is something I mentioned that it is problematic because I think calibration should not actually depend on training set size. So are some models that maybe they have less um, dependence on the on the size of the training set in terms of calibration, but most models they have a very clear linear relationship with this, like that the model becomes more calibrated with less error in the calibration as the size of the range set increases. Also, the UQ is less confident when the number of samples per class is low, which indicates that it's actually correctly gouging the, their own epistemic uncertainty. But other methods seem to be overconfident, and in that, that's uh, not, not, not good for, for the community and for the, for the estimation of uncertainty. Also, the methods based on gradients seem to behave quite strangely. You can also see this on the, on the classification toy sample. And unfortunately, gradient-based methods cannot be applied to regression. So they are only for uh, classification. And additionally, they have very poor test all the output performance. So this, uh, these results are very mixed. Like it works kind of well in some cases, but in most cases it works uh, not, not very well. And also it has the worst calibration error in both the training and test sets in comparison to the, to the other methods. I think that also means that uh, these, are, these gradient based methods are new, but that also means that maybe we need to do more research to actually understand how they work and uh, what are the limitations? So I think this this research at least points into the direction that we should not uh, evaluate methods used based on on standard benchmarks and only some tasks, because the, the performance might change with uh, the size of the training set. Also, ensembles are very competitive in terms of accuracy and calibration error, but they also don't perform as well in, in some auto distribution detection scenarios. And finally, um, it is not clear if yeah, we should use the maximum probability or the entropy for uh, auto distribution detection. Like there are publications that say that uh, we should use maximum probability or to other size uh, entropy. And I think maybe it depends on, on the task and the size of the training set. <clears throat> now to close this presentation, in this work we evaluate and compare uncertainty methods as the size of the training set is varied. So of course there is no method that clearly outperforms all others across all the size of the training set. Some methods work very well for calibration but also may um, maybe outperform in different auto distribution detection settings. So I think this paper shows that uh, the standard uncertainty quantification methods have issues with calibration across training set sizes, 
meaning that they don't produce a real epistemic uncertainty. Maybe it's a only a weak estimation of epistemic uncertainty. And there are also very mixed results between classification and relation tasks. So I hope with this uh, research, we can motivate researchers to take a deeper look into uncertainty and confidence instead of only improving uh, benchmarks. So I, I can take questions in the, in the Q&A session later, or also you can come to my poster into poster session where we can definitely discuss this. So thank you for attending and bye bye. Um, so like, uh, like we are working on this uncertainty quantification on the classification data sets uh, on the images. I'm just wondering like how we are going to scale this approach on like, let's consider like on images, seg semantic segmentation of the images, like per pixel classification we are doing. So I'm just wondering like how, what are your views on that? Like how the semantic segmentation will be helpful in this particular scenario? Well, then in general, there are papers that do uncertainty quantification for semantic segmentation. And you usually get, uh, in, of course, instead of having like all just probabilities, you can get a kind of a saliency map of the uncertainty. And usually what happens is that you have higher uncertainty in the borders between the regions of the semantic segmentation map. So I have also worked, for example, in 3D semantic segmentation of point clouds. And that's what also happens. But I, I also think that that's also very interesting because, um, for example, for applications like autonomous driving, you also need to have kind of semantic segmentation or panoptic segmentation. And for this, you need to actually have uh, uncertainty. So I only did this, this kind of toy experiments because I use only fashion units and cyber 10. And I think it will be also very interesting to see if the same thing happens in semantic segmentation, where like the labels that you have maybe have a lot more information. So I think that's also an important concept to consider how much information are there in the labels and how this affects the output uncertainty, right? But like, yeah, I, I got your point. Like, uh, I was just wondering, like, how about uh, like running so many models, uh, like inference on a very large images, let's consider like, uh, and running it on multiple times, that's going to like increase your time for our to computation of the uncertainty. And sometimes it's very costly and we want to avoid it. Oh, yes. So what is like any other way of like has been explored in this area, like uh, to see what are the other chance? Yeah, so one method that I evaluated this DUQ, it's actually a deterministic method. So you only need one forward pass to actually have output uncertainty. Okay. And you can also apply to semantic segmentation. And also I published two years ago in the latest uh, New Rips um, in person in 2019, a paper about sub ensembles where we actually share weights between uh, ensemble members. So you can actually have one forward pass through a large network and then smaller forward passes through the parts of the network. And this actually makes the, the inference much faster and you can still get uh, good uh, high quality of the modification. And there are also people working on, for example, doing um, student teacher models, like to try to extract the uncertainty of a large model into a smaller model, or maybe try to do quantization as well. So I think you can also combine all the techniques that we use to make um, inference faster uh, to also apply into uncertain quantification. So I think that's also very promising uh, research directions. Great. Okay. Thanks. Thanks for your answer.